Hello and welcome to today's seminar, Myanmar in 2022, one year of resistance to military rule. We are very pleased that so many of you have decided to join this seminar, which is organized jointly with the Folkebanadot Academy. Uh, both of our organizations carry out research and practical work in relation to Myanmar's democratic movements. My name is Christina Simeon, and I'm a research fellow here at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and a senior rule of law specialist at the Falkenbernadotte Academy. Today's seminar takes stock of the current situation in Myanmar just over a year after the armed forces, or Tatmadaw, arrested members of the elected government and started their campaign to once again wipe out civilian political opposition. The Myanmar military carries out a war against the civilian population. They routinely commit extrajudicial killings, airstrikes, massacres, sexual and gender-based violence, mass arrests, torture and detention, and other atrocities with total impunity. But today we want to highlight resistance to the coup rather than a focus on the actions of the military. This resistance is seen in countrywide uprisings, the formation of the national unity government, and in foreign donor support to a constitution process to prepare for future democratic transition. The Myanmar people are determined to end military tyranny and bring the country back uh, to the path towards democracy. Our speakers today will help us understand the situation on the ground in Myanmar, and especially the opportunities and possible ways forward for a democratic Myanmar. Our first speaker, Nini Jha, is a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities in Germany, and a honorary fellow at the Peter McCullin, McMullen Center on Statelessness at the University of Melbourne. And Nini Jha will give us a brief introduction to the Myanmar Spring Revolution and an update on the nation, nationwide mass protests, the civil disobedience movement and the armed revolution one year after the coup. Uh, thereafter, Lian Sukong, who is the Minister of Federal Union Affairs in the National Unity Government of Myanmar, will introduce the work of the National Unity Government. He will provide an update on its development of the, over the past year and some forward-looking ideas related to the relationship between the popular revolution and the political process and more. Finally, Cecilia Bilichot, who is a senior specialist on dialogue and mediation at the Falk Bernadotte Academy, will introduce how foreign donors can work in support to constitution process to prepare for future democratic transition and governance arrangements. She will also present some practical considerations of how this work looks like in practice in Myanmar. After the three speakers, we will have time for discussion. So please post your questions as the seminar proceeds in the Q&A box. Thank you very much. And with that, I will give the word to Nini Jha. Thank you, Chris. Okay. So thank you, Christina. And thank you very much to the organizers of this important event for inviting me to speak and to the audience for attending it. I'm, I'm very honored. First, let me say that I really like the title of the event itself. Myanmar in 2022, one year of resistance to military rule. The Myanmar military mounted a promissory coup on 1st February 2021. Therefore, numerous events and commentaries last January or February use phrases such as Myanmar coup one year on or one year on from the Myanmar coup emphasizing the coup, which I personally dislike very much, to be totally honest with you. But the organizers today highlight resistance to military rule, which I think is really meaningful and suitable. Resistance to military rule in Myanmar has lasted for a little bit more than a year, and it is called or known as Myanmar Spring or the Spring Revolution. I'll try to address three set questions whose answers I think the audience will want to know like I do. I was actually in Myanmar when the coup occurred, and I only left in June 2021, or five months after the coup. So I've been living in exile since. Before and after I left my motherland, Myanmar, I have been trying to answer the three questions. And today I will share some of my prelim preliminary or partial answers. The first question is, where did Myanmar Spring come from? Myanmar Spring immediately began after the coup. 
the military made an absurd and baseless claim that there was a systemic fraud in the November 2020 elections in which the ruling National League for Democracy Party, chaired by Aung San Suu Kyi, won in a landslide. The military then overthrew the democratically elected government by force and unconstitutionally. Trying to quickly recover from shock and bitterly aware that the military is here to stay, we understood that we must resist the military rule by all means. We rejected excuses and promises of the military, so we launched the Spring Revolution. The Spring Revolution or Myanmar Spring has three components. The first component is the civil disobedient movement or CDM of government employees. The government employees who are strikers declare we shall not work for the military junta and they aim to express dissidents against the coup and disrupt the administrative missionary of the military junta. The CDM actually began the next day after the coup. Several hundreds of thousands from various government agencies readily joined the movement and enormous pressure was brought to bear upon the rest who were still unwilling to join. The second component is flash mobs and mass protest. The first, the first flash mob against the coup was actually held in Mandalay on 1st 4th of February, 2021. That was followed by a mass protest in Yangon two days later. By 7th or 8th of February, the nation of Myanmar had already risen up. Thousands of people taking to the streets every day. The third component is the armed resistance that was officially launched by the National Unity Government last September and just turned six months. A very important thing I must note about the sequence of these three components of Myanmar Spring is the, especially the armed revolution or armed resistance is that they were not really pre-planned. They developed naturally and spontaneously in response to the coup and the bloody repression of the protesters and the civil disobedience movement by the security forces. The second question is where is Myanmar Spring now at? I will, I will return to the three components because the three components constitute the Spring Revolution. First, the CDM. We don't really know the exact number of government employees who joined the CDM it's, it's in its early days. Estimates say 410,000 or so joined. After one year, at least 300,000, the majority of whom are from health and education ministries remain steadfast, steadfast and are still affiliated with the CDM. In spite of losing their public housing and salaries for almost a year now, and not getting sufficient financial assistance. Because they provide healthcare and education, medics and teachers, and like other government employees working in agencies such as immigration, banking, are generally favorably, favorably looked upon by Myanmar people. And deniably, the CDM has shamed the military hunter that acts like a state now and inflicted at least symbolic damage upon their hunter. How much of the public missionary of the military hunter is disrupted by the CDM is open to question, of course, but perhaps we will never know exactly about that, given there is little publicly available and reliable information about that. Second, flash mobs and protests. By late March 2021, it had become extremely dangerous and lethal to take to the streets. Crackdowns were violent and bloody, by June, it was almost impossible to hold a mass protest in Myanmar. From then until now, only a dozen or a few dozen young people, especially, still take to the streets and hold flash mobs a few times a week or so. Nowadays, some sizable protests are only seen in rural areas and villages in middle Myanmar that are now under the control or influence of freedom fighters or resistant forces. Myanmar Spring has also held countless digital strikes for the past 13 months. The revolution still occasionally mobilizes the people now under the mil repressive military rule by successfully organizing innovative protests such as silent strikes and blood, blood boycott campaigns. In the first two months of the revolution, we, especially young people among us, who bore witness to the repression firsthand, saw ourselves defenseless and started flocking to the areas under the control of the, of the ethnic armed groups known as liberated areas for refuge and military training, many come, came back and launched a low-scale 
urban warfare in cities such as Yangon and Mandalay. At the same time, armed resistance in other areas such as Chin State and Zagai region developed. The revolution became more intense when the legitimate national unity government announced formation of the People Defense Forces in May and declared a war of self-defense in September. So now I turn to the third question, where is Myanmar Spring heading to? Myanmar Spring is a deeply political revolution and carries a heavy burden of Myanmar's conflictual past. At a minimum, Myanmar has two chronic conflicts. First is the federal conflict between the Burma majority on the one hand and other ethnic groups on the other hand who view that the state institutions are Burma dominated and repress the minority. Second is the demo democracy conflict between the people or civilians on the one hand and the military on the other hand that has repressively ruled Myanmar since the early 1960s and now is now back in control. Myanmar only enjoyed a short respite of a partial, partial electoral democracy for some five years from 2016 until 2021 when our San Suu Kyi's NLD party came to power. But that rule itself was not all good, especially for minorities, journalists, and some activists who still face repression by their military, especially the Rohingya. But we can't deny that it was a moment of opening hope and change for the people, especially those in urban areas and the Bama majority at least, however partial it was. In the midst of that opening, Myanmar grappled with hate speech and right-wing extremist religious nationalism that targeted religious minorities, especially the Rohingya. Now, the spring revolution has to redeem Myanmar's distant and recent past and establish a future democracy, federal democracy for all. The revolution is trying to constitutionalize the emergent social compact of we the people are all united against military rule. Unity between different polit political and ethnic groups now is quite unprecedented and all view the military rule as their common enemy. Of course, there are groups like the Arkan Army and the United War State Army that are not part of the resistance and waiting it out for their own reasons. I think these plus the international dimensions of the spring revolution will be discussed in some detail by my two esteemed co-panelists. So I will not dwell upon them in detail. Throughout last year back home and among the Myanmar diaspora, exile and migrant communities across the world, helps for our immediate success of the spring revolution will extremely high. A year has passed, we struggle on, and I think many of us have managed our expectations. There are three critical issues concerning the trajectory of the spring revolution. First, every good and quite unprecedented thing in terms of unity, compromise and agreement now will only continue to exist and become institutionalized if the revolution is successful, fully or partially or in the near future. Second, to fight and win the Myanmar military is neither easy nor cheap. Myanmar was already poorer than before due to the pandemic when the coup occurred and, on, and it's on its way to becoming poorer than ever. The humanitarian crisis from the repression of the military and the civil war is colossal. For example, Myanmar now has about 900,000 internally displaced people, a number that will only grow in the near future. Third, the support of the international community. Having seen how the West, quote unquote, has responded to the invasion of Ukraine by flexing its economic muscles and waging a soft war against Russia, I believe there is a lot more the international community can do to help Myanmar Spring. I will not detail about that. To conclude, I ask myself repeatedly, day and night, am I optimistic about the future of Myanmar Spring? I think the revolution has arrived at a stage where there is no return yet. Bridges have been burned willingly or unwillingly. The military hunter has not been able to pacify the country and no country in the world openly recognizes it at a, it, I mean, the hunter as a de jure government. So the coup has certainly failed, but soldiers, soldiers now portray themselves as the guardian of Myanmar's democracy, which is a cliche and self-hypnotizing not trying that serves their own interests. But does it mean the revolution has won or will win? I would say it will take a little bit more time or I don't know how much time. And, but we have to be patient and unfortunately we will incur more human and material costs along the way. Of course, 
my answer is still very tentative and subject to change along the way. So I'll stop here for the sake of time. And I look forward to questions, comments, and even disagreement in the end. Thank you all very much. May the spring revolution win. Thank you very much, Nini Jo. And I will just remind the audience that you can already now type in your questions in the Q&A chat box, uh, and we will go through the questions after our three speakers. Um, but with that, I will leave it to uh, Lian Sakong to continue this seminar. Uh, thank you so very much for inviting me to speak at this uh, very important event. And then at the point that I would like to describe for this evening event, uh, Guni Nijo uh, telling us a lot about uh, what I would like to say and describe the event. I think so. I agree with him most of what he was saying. So, uh, and I thanks Guni Nijo. He made me uh, my, 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 my trust easier because he has described already all the backgrounds and what has happened and what is happening and then what is our future and what we are hoping for and what we would like to do. So thank you, Kunini Jo. And uh, I would like to say thank you also to Christina and Cecilia and all uh, friends from uh, FBA. And thank you so much for organizing this event. I think this is very important. When you, after all this struggle, I think we pay so much price already, so much life, so much blood, so much of you know people's livelihood. So much life is sacrificed. So much of people's livelihood has uh, destructed destroyed by the military regimes. So I think this is uh, in one year, this is enormous sacrifice that we, the people of Burma has made. And then if you compare, for example, just one area, I would like to remind you that refugees, our country has been in war with the government, the people against the government for 70 years. But just to compare from 1990 to 2010s, how many people flee from Burma to our neighboring countries? But in 20 years, the number has much more in one year between 2021 and 2022. The number is much more than in 20 years in one year especially from Granny State, Chin State, and many other states. I think this is uh, the, uh, the tragedy, the sad story that we are facing. So tonight I would like to dwell on just three challenges before I speak to you about uh, what is NUG and what we would like to achieve in this struggle as a people, not as a government. Um, I must say that NUG is National Unity Government formed by the CRPH. Um, CRPH is Committee for Representing Pidu Luto, elected by the people uh, in the 2020 November elections. So we are a legitimate government but this is a national unity government, not just an LD government, not just elected government. We combine our mandate, both uh, what we call is the jury mandate. The jury mandate is um, the people's mandate and de facto mandate. This de facto mandate is quite important for in our country, 70 years of the struggle from ethnic arms organizations and also from um, the spring revolutions. So this, uh, the jury mandate and effective is mandate is combined 
and form the national unity government. This is who we are, and then this is what I'm representing. National unity government. And tonight, what I would like to highlight is this revolution, this struggle has three main components. And these three main components also have three main challenges. Where there is opportunity, there is a challenge as well. As Kuninijo already uh, highlighted about uh, CDMs, uh, I think people revolutions and demonstration on the streets and the struggle against this military coup is very important factor in our struggle. And especially CDM, civil disobedience movement that we call it, but those who are uh, the, the workers from government sector, who doesn't would like to cooperate with the government and against the military coup and would like to working for the people and would like to working for the freedoms, we call them CDMs, those who are engaged in CDMs. And according to the NUG uh, statistics, there are more than um, 400,000 CDMs. And ours, uh, the National Unity Government would like to contribute and help them, those CDMs, to sustain the struggle and help them in their livelihood in a little bit uh, better way. But of course, we cannot do much. We cannot do much. What we can do is based on the people of Burma, especially those who are living in overseas, um, overseas and then uh, in abroad, America, Europe, Australia, and many other countries, they contributed money to help the CDMs. And so far, so far, um, at the first part of our struggle, CRPH collected some monies around $20 million, $20 million. And then most of the monies we try to send back to the country for the CDMs and other activities. Under NUG government, we are able to collect around 30 million US dollar, which we try to help a CDM as well as PDF. I'll come back to PDF about PDF. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that CDMs is one of the most important element in our struggle. The most important poses for this struggle. Without CDMs, I don't think we will win the struggle. So tonight, I would like to request not only our audience, but also international community. This is important struggle for the freedom of the, not only the people from Burma, but the whole human community. For the whole international community. If the struggle for freedom in Burma is not succeed, and Burma would become like a North Korea. Burma would become like going back to the Cold War era. Burma will going back to the dark age, which we don't want. For that reason, I think our struggle is so important, not only for the people of Burma, but for the whole human community, the whole world, the whole, I think, humanity. 
So I think we deserve the help from international community. So I ask international community and those who are listening to us tonight to help the city members. They are the most important front lines workers. They are the most important group of people who have been struggling for the freedom of our country. So without international community help, NGG could not sustain after one year. It will be very difficult. I must say also that NGG could give us very, very, very little amount of money to them. Maybe 30,000 jets a month. 30,000 jets, what they can do? Just a few weeks, a few days of, uh, I mean, uh, morning breakfast, munginka. They just could buy munginka, not rice, not tamin, not dinner, nyasa. I think this is a very, very little amount of money that we could contribute. But Enjuji cannot do much more than this one. So in this area, to help the CDMs, we need international community help. And then all, I don't know how many people are listening to us, how many audience we have, but I ask international community and the human community, the world community to come us and help us. If we are not able to sustain CDMs, then what will be the result? The result will be the coming back of Military, the coming back of dictatorship. Do we want it? We don't want. It. We don't want. It. We simply don't want to coming back of militarism. In our history of 70 years of our history, we have enough experience of this kind of military dictatorship. Military dictatorship, one party dictatorship, it is enough. So we must win. So please come and help. The CDM bus. Uh, okay. Lian, we have two more minutes of your speaking time. Uh, perhaps okay. you want to um, present, uh, you presented a lot of the obstacles. Maybe there have been some successes in the work of NUG for this past year. If you would like to share any such reflections, we would be very thankful. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina. The second area that I would like to touch upon is. Uh, 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 refugees and um, IDP, internally displaced person, and uh, the military regime knew that they know that where this is our vulnerable, and they attack the people themselves, they destroy the people's life. So, for example, in uh, Granny State and Chin State and Sky divisions, they destroy so many villages and so many. Uh, people life. So they created so many IDP people and so many refugees. So this is the area where we cannot, the NGG government cannot help enough or provide enough money and enough humanitarian aid. This is the area I really would like to international community to come and help us. If you are not helping us in all these people, as I said, this is, if we compare, the number is bigger than 20 years. This one year's number is bigger than 20 years of previous from 1990 uh, to uh, 2010. And then the third area, of course, is uh, PDF, People Defend Process. The PDF with the NUG did not create it. People come up themselves and defend themselves. Their community, their people, their family, and their, uh, so they are coming up. So there are at least 20, uh, 240, uh, 400 uh, PDF in Burma. But we, the NGG, try to picking up and then putting them into the command and control system systematically. And these PDF, if we are not putting them into the com one command and control system, what will happen is in our country, 
at least 200 to 400 warlords, which we don't want to see for our future. So these we all uh, we would like to put into one command and control under NGG government defense uh, uh, ministry of defense. So this is the area we would like to also uh, put in place. Otherwise, you know, the aggressor, we are in we are at war with uh, the military regimes. These military regimes is fighting against the people. We have to resist. We have to fight against these military regimes, but in a systematic way. For that Thank reason, so we are- Yeah, final we word. Are putting in place, we, are, we are putting in place, and this is the area we need international community concern and help, and the people of Burma concern and help as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lian Sekong. I especially appreciate the way you describe the NUG as a people and not a government. And you really emphasize the connection to the CDMers and how important it is that you're working together. Um, I would like to remind everyone that you can post your questions in the Q&A box. And I'll now leave it, uh, leave the word to Cecilia Bilicha, who will talk about um, well, international support uh, to some 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 sectors uh, and on some issues, uh, not not all of the uh, issues Lian Sakong mentioned, but at least some of them. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank the Swedish Institute of International Affairs for the invitation and my fellow panelists and also you, Christina, as the moderator. Um, there are of course uh, immediate crises uh, to attend to. But uh, looking in a long-term perspective, we have also been starting to work on the constitution-making process. And as you all know, the constitution-making has become an integral part of the transition process. Previously, the transition from authoritarian rule or a violent conflict often started with an election after a peace agreement. But in the last decade, the transition has more frequently started with um, both some type of an election, but also a constitutional process. And this has given an opportunity to discuss a broad range of key elements of democracy in an early stage uh, and plan for a more long-term and sustainable peace as it outlines the aspirations among the people for the future of the nation. So previously, constitution building processes has involved a small group of people, often the elite, writing a whole document for one country. And this is something that has changed. And the element of inclusion has often become the core of the process. And this in practical term has meant that people's constitution is in focus, meaning that the process aims at uh, resulting in a document for the nation drafted by the people for the people. Some, um, something that has required not only a change in domestic politics, but also inclusion has become the lead word for also the international community in its support to facilitate these processes. So the international support has been focusing a lot on drafting the constitution, providing often international experts, um, constitutional lawyers offering their support to national drafters. And such type of support still exists, but the support has been broadened to also include other types of assistance, such as thinking through and carry out process design, civic education, outreach programs, uh, all with the aim of e increasing inclusion and participation. Often this uh, outreach component have been seen as time consuming and very costly. And um, with time, because um, of the demand for inclusion, this has now become a part of the constitution making process. Um, it includes both an element of information sharing, 
to ensure that citizens understand the constitution and the process, but it also includes a submission part, meaning that people are provided an opportunity to voice their opinion. And often this process requires a great deal of organization and the issues of archiving and responding to submissions are still areas that we in the international communities are thinking a lot of. So um, in other words, moving from war to peace or a democratic society has often been reconditioned by a public demanding inclusion in decision making. Often a change in the distribution of power from a centralized to more decentralized power structure and the issue of inclusion has been reflected in the constitution building process as well, paying greater attention to citizens' opinions and facilitating for public participation. Um, it has become clear that uh, to ensure sustainability, it is important to anchor the decision among the people. They are the ones affected by the document and they are the ones that are going to realize the constitution itself. And this is not a decision that can be made top down, but all citizens' aspiration needs to be taken at least into consideration in creating a future for the nation. It is often said that the real heavy lifting starts when the implementation begins. So the FBA support to the Myanmar process with the focus on constitution building involves both assistance in the process design, as well as providing platform for discussions regarding the constitution. And the support entails both responding to requests, but also focusing uh, our work on the main FBA expertise, the development of the public consultation process to ensure participation and to stress the importance of inclusivity. And the FBA has also been very keen to work both with the formal institutions as well as the informal sector, meaning that we are trying to support different groups within the democracy movement, from energy to interest organizations. And to equal the playing field, FBA tries to ensure that support is given to the informal sector, such as the civil society, by hosting and facilitating dialogues regarding the process of dialogue, as well as specific thematic fields, such as security sector reform and the reintegration of combatants and so forth. However, all this activity aims at providing a platform for learning and to dialogue to better understand the issues at hand and formulate options that can be presented in the larger constitutional process. So our hope is that such support will contribute to a more joint understanding of what groups aspiring to in the future of Myanmar, and that this will be transformed into a joint document that can be a platform for a democratic future, a draft constitution um, by the people and for the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Um, and we already have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so I will get right to that. And if you want to post your questions, just type them in the Q&A box. Uh, I will directly uh, start with a question that um, uh, continues on the topic of constitutional support. Uh, so this question is um, to Leanne Sacon. Um, so I would invite you to maybe speak a little bit more about uh, your involvement and your work with the constitutional process. And I want to connect that to a question from the audience, um, which asks uh, if you have uh, sort of noticed any uh, interest from neighboring countries. So is this constitution building process how does that link to regional political scenarios and interests of neighboring countries? If you have any such experiences. Um, so a little bit about the uh, constitutional process that the NUG and other actors are involved in, and then um, uh, how you see that that links uh, to the regional political scenario and interests of neighboring countries, if you have experienced any such interest. 
Oh, you are asking me the question? Yes. Um, so if you could uh, just speak briefly about the constitutional process that you are involved with, uh, and if you have uh, experienced um, any political interests from neighboring countries, uh, so neighboring countries to Myanmar. Well, every country is different. We have our own conditions. So Burma, we have been struggling for this constitutional crisis and trying to achieve what kind of the country we wanted to establish. It was started in 1947 at Panlong Conference. And in 1961 and 62, we ethnic nationalists proposed a democratic and a federal union. And then we put in place that kind of principles based on uh, democratic principle and federal principle. That was what we continue in our whole struggle. And, and even in uh, when the President Deng's in period in uh, 2012 to 2020, during the peace process, where I was one of uh, chief negotiator as uh, the vice chairman of UPDJC, we propose the, uh, the future of one, our country based on uh, federal and democratic union. What I'm trying to uh, say is that our country should be based on democratic principle and federal principle. This is what we would like to achieve. And now, uh, since uh, it is a military coup, we, the people of Burma, coming together and gather together. And then we created NGCDC. National Unity, um, National Unity Consultative Council. In this struggle, actually, we have created three mechanisms, NGCC, NGG as a government, and CRPH as a parliament. These three uh, mechanisms working together to achieve uh, creating or establishing a federal democratic union. And, uh, we have produced um, a federal charter in uh, March uh, 2021, which we amended and then uh, more inclusive and more comprehensive. And we reproduce the final, uh, the final uh, uh, federal democratic charter in January 2022, in which we clearly define what kind of the country we would like to re-establish, we would like to rebuilding our country based on the Palo Agreement and based on democratic and federal union. So uh, and now what we are doing is um, NUG and NUCC form what we call is an, a joint coordinating committee and uh, about uh, how to uh, uh, draft a uh, federal uh, constitution. So uh, we call JCC Federal Joint Coordinating Committee for Federal Constitution Drafting Committee. And we adopted, uh, based on the, our charter, five guiding principles on federalism and 64 federal principles. This is how we, are, we would like to reestablish our country. And all these are actually based on uh, not a new one. It is based on the Panglong Agreement of 1947. And then uh, 1962 and 60, 61 and 62, Tongsi Conference and Federal uh, Seminars uh, Principle. So this is how we would like to rebuild our country. But um, uh, you are asking me about to, how to compare with our neighboring countries. Uh, our neighboring countries, which uh, you meant, I don't know, but in most of Southeast Asian countries, they are mostly dictators countries and mostly not democratic, mostly not a federal. So our model will be not exactly the same as our neighboring countries. We have our own country, we have our own experience, we have our own history. So we will be based, we will be rebuild our country, our country based on our own situation our own, uh, the need of the people and then the need of the country. So I think our future will be based on um, 
the Panglong Agreement, which called for democratic federal union. And this is what we adopted in our fed, uh, federal charter. So uh, I think we will be working on it. And then uh, as a minister of uh, federal union affairs, and also part of JCC Federal, which is a comedy, a joint committee between NGC and NGC, I think we'll be working on it. So uh, I don't know how to compare with other countries, but based on our own country experience and in our country desire, the people desire, and the need of the country, we'll be doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lian Sikong. And we have one more question uh, concerning constitutional processes. So I will direct this question to Cecilia Bilicha. You have worked for um, decades in countries like Somalia and Nepal with these processes. Uh, so this question is, uh, in a context where people do not really trust the institutional structures, say like Myanmar, uh, nor the political processes after a long story of violence and authoritarian rule, how can you generate trust and ground expectations in a participative, inclusive constitutional process? Mm, that's, a, that's a very good question, a very relevant question. I mean, trust is always uh, difficult to generate eh, in this kind of circumstance and, and contexts. I think one way of, of approaching it is really trying to um, include people in the process and making citizens feel that they are part of the process. Um, it's often, we have often conducted public um, consultations um, asking for submissions, but uh, we are still lacking in some, some archiving and documenting and also responding uh, in a way that is that is understandable and suitable to to the opinions that are being posted and i think one one way of working towards a, an increased trust is really trying to cluster uh, the opinions that that we are receiving and answering uh, explaining and the justification behind the decisions being made i mean it's it's um, everyone understands that not all opinions can be included in the constitution and in, in one document. But it's important that also, um, that we also describe why and, and that it's not the end of the end of the road that is given more opportunities further down the line. For example, in, the, uh, in laws and in regulations that these issues can be included and to keep on working on the inclusion aspects. I think it's also important that, um, for example, um, the public um, outreach component is also tailored to the local context, both um, language-wise, but also understanding that we are coming from different backgrounds and maybe different uh, understanding of these type of topics. So it's as, as broad as possible. Um, for example, conducted in different languages, by people from the certain regions and so forth. Um, and also that people get help with understanding both the content of the constitution, the process itself, but also how to write the submissions. And often those teams are created around the constitution process today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And we have uh, two questions for uh, Nini. Um, I'll start first. Um, as stated that the revolution has reached a point of no return, how to make it move forward to the destination of a new federal Myanmar in a non-violent mean. Um, and I'll read out the other one uh, as well, so, and you can take your, some time and answer both of them. Um, the risks for youth or young leaders are high in Myanmar to step forward to create a youth civil movement in a situation where civil society has been paralyzed. How can we build networks of youth and create dialogue, or is this impossible in current situation? And if impossible, can we create other processes for this? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the two people who have raised these questions. Very good questions. So I will first respond to the questions ab about the youth, I mean, which is less violent, <laughs> which is less, um, less concerned with war and violence anyway. So, and I, 
in Myanmar Spring, right, since the beginning of the revolution, we have seen the emergence of a actor, an imagined constructed actor, which is which we all call the Generation Z or Generation Z, right? Which refers to youths, university students, even high school students, right? Depending on how you classify their ages. So of course, that is very true that you know, before the, before the coup, before the revolution, the voice of the youths were very much marginalized because of the political ascendancy of Aung San Suu Kyi and her fandom and, and her supporters. And so whenever youths and university students union, especially criticize Aung San Suu Kyi and her government, her supporters will respond. This is not, this is not your area. So you just go to school and study and you do your work, right? This is, the, this is the area of politicians and this is the area of Aung San Suu Kyi. But after the coup, right? After, so after the coup, the youths and the university student unions emerged as one of the most important actors in the revolution. So now the youths, but they're very much deeply involved in the revolution. Many are in the jungle training and fighting or many are still taking to the streets. So they haven't really put up with a youth voice yet. Although youths are also sitting in the NUCC, which is the, the highest political body of Myanmar Spring. So, but when and if Myanmar Spring succeeds, I believe there will be a much, much louder youth voice in the near future. So I see, a, I am very optimistic about youth activism and youth voice in the near future, but depending on how the revolution goes. So now I'll move to the second questions about nonviolence. Oh, yes, I did say that the revolution has arrived at a stage where there is no return, but I did emphasize that for now, right? Yes, bridges have been burned. So, but this dichotomy, dichotomous thinking of violence and nonviolence, it's pretty, pretty misinformed. I mean, in my opinion, of course, you know, it's very easy to say something is violent or something is nonviolent. So let's say in war studies, for example, there is a just war theory or just war tradition, which try to seek a middle ground between the realist tradition, which doesn't really care about morality, which, which just says that we have to go to war for whatever reasons. And the second, the other opposite tradition that it's pacifist, which doesn't really condone any war under any conditions. I think Myanmar Spring has kind of struck a middle ground. For example, you know, if, I mean, the Myanmar people in the audience will know that Dama and Adama. So, the, so we are fighting against injustice. We are fighting against oppression. So our war or our revolution is just. So the Myanmar Spring Revolution has, has found uh, this middle ground just word tradition, which couldn't always be seen as, uh, as violent. I would say. So, so the real world is not that simple as something is violent and something is not violent. Real world politics is much more complicated than that. So I'll stop my answer here. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now several questions. Um, we have uh, several questions to come that concerns um, religious and ethnic diversity uh, and their posts they're directed both towards um, Lian Sakong and Nini Jo. Um, but I'll ask, uh, I'll start with a question also to the both of you um, about gender equality. Um, sort of what role is there for women uh, for their meaningful participation in the CDM movement? Uh, what can be done to sustain and not lose achievements made for gender equality? and to prevent gender-based uh, violence. So the work that was done before the coup, how can we sustain that after the coup? Um, and how could international donors best support? Uh, how can the NUG uh, support this work? Uh, so, so the floor is open for both of you to answer that question. I think uh, Seyad Lian is more suitable to answer this question. 
Do you have any comment, Lian, um, about sort of sustaining uh, the work that has been done on gender equality and the role of women in the CDM movement? Um, if, if you have any plans and any uh, suggestions on how that work can be um, sustained so that uh, some of the previous efforts are not um, does not just um, so we take that forward for for the future. Um, any ideas, Lian? Uh, I I'm not quite sure what is your, your question, but let, uh, let me uh, let me uh, let me read it yeah. from the audience. Do, 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, what role is the NUG playing in promoting gender equality and women's meaningful participation in the CDM movement? Well, uh, as I said, this movement is conducted by three uh, very important institutions, NUG as a government, CRPH as a um, uh, representative of Piron uh, Sujoto and NUCC, uh, where most of uh, the stakeholders are involved. And then NUCC is the place where we produce our common strategy and our common policy. And then NUCC is the one that produced our federal charter. And in our federal charter, all these gender equality the role of uh, women, the role of uh, uh, all the minority groups and everything is uh, clearly described. As I already mentioned, we have five uh, guiding principles and 64 federal principles in which we clearly mentioned about the, 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 all these uh, principles and uh, gender equality and then everything. And then we also clearly describe about minorities' uh, rights, like Rohingya and other minority groups, which, in which they should have equal right and equal opportunity. This is what we clearly describe. So I think this is very important. But I would like to go back uh, whether this is a peaceful movement or uh, a violent movement. I don't know how to describe it. We do, we the people, we the people do not choose violent movement. The military, Min Aung Thain and his military groups are the one who choose violence. We the people has the power. That power is, is expressed through election, which we clearly express in 2020 November elections but the military regimes destroyed that power through violence. So I, I was requesting, but it was not possible perhaps about to show you how brutal they are, how to kill the, the people, how to destroy the people alive, how they destroying the whole country through violence means. So in such a situation, how could we say about peaceful movement? We the people, and UG is representing the people. As a people government, we are totally identified with the people. So we the people could not have other choice since the military is so brutal. I, I wish I could show you the picture, some very few, few pictures that come out today in Granny State, Kia State. How brutal they are. How do they kill people? How do they just destroy the people's life? So in such a situation, I think that, uh, this is the time very, very, I wish my whole life I have been for nonviolence. I, I have been for uh, peaceful uh, transitions and I was engaged in uh, peace negotiations my whole life. I haven't done it. But in this situation, it is so, so difficult for us how to respond it. Next next question is for you as well, Lian. Um, 
so one uh, person from the audience has heard that the NUG aims to eradicate uh, the military and win the revolution in 2022. So the question is, is there any plan in NUG if the revolution takes longer than 2022? Uh, I understand this question is tricky to answer, but this person from the audience would just hear uh, you elaborate on that. Uh, and a follow-up question to that question for, for all of you is, um, if there are other efforts that can be done to support uh, the CDM movement and the resistance movement, uh, or is funding the most efficient, effective support? Mm. Well, uh, uh, Christina, I think uh, we, the Burmese people, have a saying: "You, you should not predict the weather in the politics." So, uh, I we should I should not predict we would win before the end of 2020, uh, 2022, or 2020, uh, yeah, 2022. So it is a very very difficult to predict, but we wish we win. And then, as I said uh, in my uh, opening statement, I highlighted three areas: CDMs, PDF, and refugees and then uh, PDA, uh, uh, CDM must. If international community and the people of Burma could sustain two areas, especially CDM must, support the CDM must, and then PDF and refugees, and then we, the NUG government, could focus on PDF to fight Myon and history teams, and to win this war, which we could focus. But now uh, we, we are able to collect some monies, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 30 million from NUG and 20 million from uh, CRPH. But all this money we spent for CDMs and refugees and humanitarian aids, not for fighting against these brutal military regimes. But if the international community could help in these two areas, then we and UG might be able to focus on PDF, People Defend Forces, and fighting against mil the military regimes. And I think uh, it will be, I think, uh, more helpful for uh, to find the solutions. And then the, the, another area that I would like to highlight also is that we are now calling what we call is to embrace the people's heart, which is uh, for the, the defectors, uh, the defectors from the, the regime's uh, military the armed forces. So, so many people are coming and joining us to NUG, and we are providing their safetyness and their uh, livelihood, which is quite a big burden for us. If international community could help those people to resettle in the third countries, then number one, it will be very uh, much easier for us financially and others ways. And that thirdly, if international community can provide those defectors, then much higher ranking officer will defect it. And then I think if I, we know that not all the military uh, and the, uh, the soldiers and the, the general do not support men of high history teams, they would like to defect, but they need to be guaranteed their life is safe. They could be resettled in the third countries, in the Western countries, and they are protected. If international community and the people are able to provide such a safety net, then there will be much more defectors from very high ranking. They contacted us, but we cannot guarantee for their safety net because we do not have a mechanism and because we do not have uh, Western countries to provide us that they will take up those uh, defectors. So if uh, I think um, there's a lot of if question, 
if the Western countries and you know um, another countries could provide and give them such kind of safetyness, then we will have much more defectors from the high, uh, the generals and the commanders and you know regional commanders. So I think it will be very helpful for our movement. Thank you very much, Lian. We have so many questions, which is great, and only 10 minutes to go. Uh, so this question is uh, for Cecilia uh, Bilecho. Um, how, and also based on your previous experience, how can religious actors and religious leaders play a part in generating trust in an inclusive constitutional process? Well, that's a really good question as well. And I think um, that we have shown a lot of examples around, the, uh, around in, in the global arena that uh, the religious leaders plays an important role in both uh, the information sharing, um, increasing the understanding, but also the interest for constitutional matters and discussing it within smaller communities. This is also kind of what we talked about previously to link it to the to the local uh, context and to, to uh, make it uh, available to all citizens. So in many places, it has been groups of religious leaders that has been directly linked to the public consultation process that has then been, been discussing these issues in their communities. Um, they have also been uh, providing sub, uh, support to submissions and so forth, which has then been included in the in the larger process um, and and uh, discussed uh, on national or state level. So Cecilia, how do you promote a dialogue between diverse groups with different understandings on constitution building and institutional traditions in such an overarching process uh, like the one in Myanmar? I think once again that uh, we are going back to kind of building the trust uh, from local level and 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 upwards. And I think that the discussions needs to be taking place on different levels um, from from initially from, from the initial part of the process. Um, Previously, we have often discussed uh, constitutions on a on a national level. It has been a very top down. Um, dialogue and I think it's shifting uh, more and more to to focus on local levels and trying also as I said to also cluster um, the opinions that is coming in as submissions but and then answering the justification has all to communicate justification for decisions being made um, is one of the 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 big components that we have to look more into how to formulate and how to inform people both in written form but also in oral form to really facilitate for citizens to understand the decisions being made and the opportunities that are then being created later on and down the road. Thank you. And um, we have a question for Nini Jha. Uh, what do you think will be the role of interfaith dialogue and interfaith cooperation in rebuilding social cohesion and trust and contribute to peace building in the country onwards? Uh, is there a role? How can this be supported by the international, international community? Uh, and after that, I will give our speakers uh, the opportunity to answer the question uh, is democracy achievable in Myanmar? And how do you deal with the ethnic diversity uh, question in this quest? Uh, and unfortunately, I do not think we will have time for the remaining questions, uh, but um, we'll start with those questions and then we'll see how we go. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So, as someone who has been like the past seven or eight years on the role of extremist religious movements, and it it's, and its impact on the Myanmar's you know, liberalization and democratic transition, I was constantly worried since the coup if the military is going to use religion or religious politics in, in, in a very ugly way. The military has somehow hasn't done it. It hasn't done it. So, so interfaith, the role of interfaith dialogues could be useful, but because the, the religious factor is not very 
important or very prominent for now. During, I mean, I'm talking about the revolution, but that said, in the constitution building and constitution making process, process itself, we really need good constitutional buffer against the misuse of religion, right? So when we finalize our, our interim constitution and our permanent constitution along the road, it will be very important and very good to have constitutional articles that explicitly state that religion must not be misused in this way, that way, blah, blah, blah. So it will be very important for interfaith dialogues groups, existing ones or potential ones to contribute to this area of the constitution making process. Yes, uh, please, Leanne, final words before we end this seminar today. Uh, thank you very much uh, about the religions. I think in our charter, in our principle, we opted for a secular uh, state where religion and politics is not mixing up. In our country, unfortunately, religion was misused for political purpose, especially in uh, parliamentary period. Uh, Prime Minister Uno, he misused religions for his political propaganda. And he adopted Buddhism as a state religion in 1961, which was under parliamentary democracy period. And when we practice democracy, and that democracy become the tyranny of majority for uh, minority ethnic groups and minority religious group, I think we must stop that one. That's why when we adopted our federal charter, uh, the first one was in March last year, and then the final one was in January this year and we adopted secular state where religion is not mixed up with uh, politics. Religion and politics, politics should be separated. Church and state should be separated. I think this is the only answer we need for our future country. And then also in uh, uh, our struggle for 70 years after we got independence. I think uh, the main struggle is between whether we would like to establish a federal union where many different ethnic groups, many uh, different religious groups can live peacefully together or a country, a unitary national country where one ethnicity, one religion, one language policy is adopted through nation building process. Unfortunately for our country, from 1948 to uh, today, this one religion, one language, one ethnicity policy is adopted. This is what we majority ethnic group against through 70 years of arms conflict, 70 years of civil, uh, civil war or arms conflict is against the nation building process with the notion of one religion, one language, one ethnicity, which is unacceptable for our country because our country is multi-ethnic countries, multi-religious countries, multi um, uh, lingua countries, so we cannot accept it. What we need is there are so many ethnic groups, there are so many uh, religious groups, there are so many uh, language groups. All these groups, all these people must find a means and way how we could live peacefully together, peaceful coexisting. This is what we need. This is what we Thank we're you very much, Lian Sakong. Now we're out of time for today's seminar. 
Uh, I would like to thank all of our three uh, guest speakers, Nini Jia, Cecilia Pilucha, Lian Sakong. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this very important and interesting discussion uh, with a very active audience. I'm sorry we didn't have time to answer all of your questions. Uh, please um, have a look out for coming seminars and thank you very much for today. Thank you.